All right, here we go. Very well. Those are to be my adversaries then. Oh, I forgot to look at his build, but I'm pretty sure I know what it is. And who is it I want to assert his will over that group? He says we're like a searching for you, almost reaching out to you. You, you, the shadow of the false night rings. They are nothing to me, but you, you who would relinquish your own liberty for the sake of them. Strange. It is fitting then that I should have to face one such as you. And Orlex stands at the ready, signaling for his two allies to do the same. By light of dawn, this cycle of the right shall cease. Let us see if we can finish this ordeal before that time. The sky above begins to shudder. The final liberation rite is about to commence. Tariq! Hi, I am prepared, Celeste. Then let our song this evening shake the stars themselves. Aye, Celeste, let us make sure of it. This is gonna be tough. This is gonna be really tough. Shit. Shit. Wait, I'm dead? Damn. Mm. You, you are the Raymonds once again. I could not simply stand by and do nothing, Orlek. Yet that is what you did when last we stood together on this blasted mountain. I fell, you simply stood. Orlek, what shall take for you to be convinced I took no part in your betrayal? Orlek seems to consider the question, but only for a moment. Give me my damn freedom, let me prevail, here and now. Would you promise to uphold our plan, to bring about a better commonwealth? No, I make no promises, I owe you nothing. Then I am sorry, Orlek, my love of country comes before all else, more than your freedom and our friendship is at stake. Your luck be damned, Wolfred, let us stand as adversaries then. Okay, I got it, finally. Yes! Alright, that's good. The sky rains ash. Soon shall your pyres own mingle with them. Just then the skies begin to rain down fire. The final throws of the cycle of the rice and the ending of the age. What? Excuse me? Jesus! Oh my... I got him too, though. Oh my god, they're fast. Damn it! Damn it! Did they throw it in? Ah! They're so good, dude! It's terrifying! Yes! Unfortunately, she didn't get the bonus. Yeah. 
Mm. Okay, he had to use himself to get it in now. Jesus! Alright. Wait, I thought I had the orb. What the fuck? Got it in. Good, good, good. <laughs> so the false nightwings bear their fangs at last. But that cannot be your finest effort. You think you deserve your freedom more than I? Then fight for it, damn you! Jesus, dude, I can't... Stop! Holy crap! So aggressive. Oh my Jesus dude Oh my god that fucking human is so aggressive Like I can't stop him Oh dude you shall rot here You shall rot as I have after all these years You false nightmares who deny me once again my rightful liberty You who deny that liberty to all the triumphs you face And vanquish under the guise of the traditions of those blasted scribes Come let us continue this glorious affair Holy crap, it's so hard just to get the orb. No, 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 no. Oh my god. And now I'm okay. No fucking. You have got to be kidding me! I FML dude. FML, like really. This is really infuriating. <laughs> to hell with you, dude. Come here, come here, I dare you. Finally. Wait. No, 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 no. Again with. <laughs> no, 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 no. Jesus, I can't do anything, dude! Holy shit! I literally can't do anything. Okay. Holy crap. This human's gonna be in my face and I literally can't kill him. Finally! Oh my god, finally! Holy crap. Orox stands breathing heavily. He looks back on your... The thin lick of flame that is his smoldering pyre before turning his attention back to your triumvirate. Stop! Just stop! Hell with you, dude. That imp is broken. Look how fast he is, dude! Okay, he, he kind of killed himself. Did he seriously throw it in? He threw it in. I hate you. Well, I guess I got her back. Okay, to hell with you, dude. Fine. We want to play combat? You want to be... Let's go. Get it. No! Come on! Oh, the tease! Come on. God, this is infuriating. That was my win. Your private wings are threatened to die or like we sound like laughter. It says nothing's prepared. One last assault against your side. It says bullshit! Come on, there's no way. This is cancer, dude. Get it! 
Hey, stamina. No, dude, I got stuck in the corner! Oh my god, this is the fifth time in a row! I should have this! Oh my. This fucking game is just a tease, 100%. Oh, fucking finally! Jesus! Oh, that was too scary. We did it. The same cannot be said. God, dude. Thus ends the liberation right. And thus, the scribes have chosen. <sighs> okay. <laughs> you can quick run a bus since 305 and 310 goes to bus stop and it's 10 minutes away. Oh, okay. Praise the scribes, we've done it. The combo for what you expect shall be the last time you see each other. Any moment now, the shimmer pool shall engulf him. Any moment now, he shall return to Goya just and join his agent in the Commonwealth to help achieve the plan. Any moment now, the cycle of the rest shall end, at least, until at least the dawn of a new age. Any moment now. And thus, the scribes have chosen. And thus, the scribes have chosen. And thus, the scribes have chosen. No. Nightwings. Rita. What have you done? What's going on? Hold. There's something wrong. Each prior time upon the false land, the shimmer pool is open, following the liberation right, and taken in whichever exile prevailed. But now all is still, and the light of stars above has all but died. You sense a growing fear that it is already too late, and the shimmer pool shall not reveal itself again. Oh no. Orlek approaches his head bowed. They inscribe save their greatest treachery for last. Then something else catches his notice. Wait. A sudden rush of starlight cascades through the stillness of the summit. Shimmer pools appeared again, different somehow, but open. Wolford looks upon it, but it does not engulf him, or at least not yet. It seems I was mistaken then. The eight scribes, this is not the greatest treachery. Treachery is our greatest jest. The shimmer pool is flung wide open. It seems that all are worthy now of freedom. Wait, everybody can go? Orlek strides towards the shimmer pool, but. Paul Doralek. Orlek glances over at the lone minstrel, minstrel, almost in surprise. The shimmer pool has lost most of its strength. You step inside, and you shall surely drown. Of that, I can assure you. He laughs to himself at this. Then we have all been cheated. No, the shimmer pool is revealed, and one of you may still return, as planned. But, as for who returns, someone shall have to choose, ere the last light of the stars is extinguished, and the right cease to be. This is the final trial of the scribes. Final trial of the scribes. Then our confrontation, the liberation right, it all was meaningless? No, the victor of the confrontation is to be the one to make the choice among those closest to the scribes, either the anointed or he who anointed them. So then the choice is mine to make, my freedom weighed against the readers, is that it? Oh, aye, it shall be either you, the reader, or it shall be either or. Oh, Fred, please make your decision quickly, lest it shall be forfeit. I do not know for how much longer the light of the stars shall offer you this gear. A snap decision, then. Fine, I have it made. No, no, you gotta be free, dude. You gotta lead the rebellion. Reader, my boy, this is a chance of freedom we earned. It's yours. Take it now and make good use of it for you and all of us. What? Wolfred wishes to give up his freedom so you may regain yours. Very well. Reader, sir, the choice that Wolfred had made, or rather the choice which he gave, it is now yours to make instead. His choice. It may keep bouncing back and forth like this? Absurd. It may, until such time as one of you is willing to accept the burden and the outcome of the choice. That is the trial, and I fear that there is little time remaining now. Mm, reader, if you were to compare two cordial with each other to accept that freedom, either one of you, then I shall gladly take it. Freedom ought to be more than some flirtatious trifle to exchange. Reader, what is your will? Shit, dude, I really wanted to give it to him! I really wanted to give it to him, but I'm afraid if I give it back to him, then neither of us will get to go. The portal might close. I sure as hell am not choosing Orlek. To hell with that guy. I guess I have to claim it myself. Better one of us than none of us. But I really wanted it to be him. 
All right, fine, I'll go. Reminds me of you have chosen to be free yourself. To be honest, I'm dead because I'm so tired. I see and understand. Then it is done. Wolfred looks to you this one last time, his heart filled with unspoken understanding. He turned to the lone minstrel for an instant, but another instant later, he's gone. He and everyone. All you feel is the coldness of the rush of water coursing all around you. Wolfred gave his freedom so you may yet have yours. I wanted him to be free, dude. Godspeed, Rita. That's me? What is that? It's a star. No stars that remain aloft. The cycle of the rites. It is finished. The Commonwealth. What shall become of it? What shall become of us? Nightwings. The opportunity to gain your freedom from the downside. Was it not enough? That night, an exiled reader returned to the Commonwealth. He was to be the last. The stars had faded, and the cycle of the rites had run its course. He found the Commonwealth in great upheaval. Spurred by the efforts of six liberated exiles, Wolfred Sandal's revolutionary plan had incited the masses. These exiles in the starless sky pretended the return of the scribes. People surged into the streets shoulder to shoulder. Led by the six exiles, their voices shook the heavens. The leadership of the Commonwealth panicked. No blood was shed that night, and by dawn it was over. Leaders of the Commonwealth had cast themselves back into exile and joined in this new cause. Thus, in its 838th year, the Commonwealth had fallen! We succeeded! The new Saharan Union declared its sovereignty in the next year. The Saharan Union declared its sovereignty in the next year. Among the changes its elected leaders ushered in, they vowed never to cast their people into exile, and they abolished the old Commonwealth decree forbidding literacy. Today, we still remember all of this. And we remember the exiles of the downside, whose deeds led to the dawning of our age, whether they returned or not. True freedom, I got an achievement. Can I interact with this? After the cycle of the rites ceased turning, records of what happened to the Black Wives and Nightwings became inclusive and contradictory. Some accounts suggest that the exiles of the Nightwings who remained in the downside continued to make use of the Black Wagon as their place of shelter and their means of travel. However, there's no record of what happened to the wagon's contents, such as the Book of Rites or the Beyonder Crystal, said to be haunted by the apparition Sandra the Unseeing. One possibility is that when the Lone Minstrel took his leave, he took the Beyonder Crystal with him, for he was thus obliged. By its line of reasoning, the Black Wagon itself should have been taken also. Others are going to be skeptical that Beyond a Crystal ever existed, or rather that the visions that it was granted were ever, anything other than the result of an act of imagination or a fever dream. The Bog Dwellers of the Southern Bog still offer another explanation for they are familiar with binding enchantments. There existed such an object in which the Sister of the Arch had been expelled for more than 800 years, the enchantment could have expired along with the light of the stars. Would the, what this would have meant for Sandra and the Beyonders is difficult to say for certain, other than that it may have meant that they were finally released. Nevertheless, the fates of Sandra and the Beyonder Crystal remain unknown. Yet those exiles of the Nightwings who claim to have seen this apparition all spoke of her with degrees of reverence or perhaps a little fear. Oh wait, I only got to interact with one? Can you believe this, reader? Honestly. Sandra's appeared before you, as well as you can see. They are so far from the mark with all this nonsense. I am want to laugh. In fact, here goes. She laughs. She is referring to the account of her. You sense she does not care for it. Well, let them gossip all they like. I merely wish that they would mention you, at least in passing, when next they are at it. Though they shall never know even the half of it, shall they? Sandra seems irritated by the incomplete account of what happened to her. Humor. You said that the real joy I'm between you would perhaps make too lascivious a tale to be told in such a format. She makes be amused sound at this. Perhaps that story ought to get out then, to think that they would go through all the trouble to make literacy acceptable once again, only to print such drivel. Anyway, let us keep going with the reader. We know the truth of it. That is what matters. She faces the Beyond Crystal Christopher now, and you tuck it away safe. I have to interact with all these? Okay, well, 
Let's let's go in order of the people I released. So what happened with Jodariel? <laughs> After liberation, Jodariel soon became an icon of the movement that led to the collapse of the Commonwealth and the rise of the Sahrian Union. Her horns and stern countenance inspired the people to believe she was solely a mer. Reborn, she became a great if reluctant leader. In the uncertain times that followed Jodariel's season, expertise often came into play both in matters of security and of state. Which is she conscripted and trained a team of volunteers in public safety. The community did not know what to make of such a cordial bunch at first, but soon came to value their service. They have stood for the people ever since, and we celebrate their founding day each year. She remained close with Hedwin all through this experience, and they supported each other through their struggles many, many times. She kept an eye on Mayhun and the last demonstrated surprising not to get by on her own, though Jadariel was always willing to provide some assistance, just in case. She continued training on her own, a regimen that grew stricter with each passing year. There were those who sought to train with her, and she sometimes obliged. There remained one other constant in her life. She would always remember her days among the Nightwings, and with fondness, for the most part. That's sweet. Hedwin. After his liberation, Hedwin was instrumental in the events leading to the fall of the Commonwealth and was vital to the outcome of the plan. The peaceful outcome of the scribe's return was attributed to several key factors. One of them was the underlying ambition of the plan itself. Another was Hedwin's visibility among the people in the streets. Identified to be a liberated exile, he was believed to be Golgothan Golgoth Golgothanian reborn. More importantly, however, was that one of the winged harps of the high-wing remnants accompanied him. She was later identified as Fikani Shane. Oh, that's the one you wanted to come back to. Their bond was symbolic of what was at stake that night and proved vital to the peace that followed. In all his days as a leader in the Saharian Union, Hedwin oft confided in his friend Jodariel. Despite her intense manner, there was no one whom he trusted more in times when circumspection was required. Hedwin would often think back about the vow he made at the beginning of his quest for freedom. Although he cherished all the friendships he made, he had pleased Jodariel, Rookie Greentail, and the reader of the Nightwings that they might all be free again together. His promise had come to pass, though he always knew that this was not his own doing. He was always deeply grateful to the other three, his closest friends. While the others who stood with the Nightwings were not all able to remain in contact thus, Hedwin thought of each of them often, and so in turn did they all think of him. Rookie. After Rookie Greentail earned back his freedom, he returned to a lavish welcome ceremony in the Commonwealth, as was the tendency for liberated exiles. It was everything he could have hoped for, and soon he was well off, surrounded by luxury and choosing between various exciting opportunities. However, he must have given into bed his better judgment, as he did end up siding with Wolfrid Sandalwood's revolutionary forces, as he promised. On the night of the scribe's return, Greentail was there with the others, inspiring the masses. They never looked prouder, the very image of Jomir Many Main himself. When dawn finally came and it became clear that the Commonwealth that everybody knew would be no more, he realized many new opportunities awaited. He began quite a lucrative career for himself, manufacturing and selling replica merchandise inspired by the downside. His main struggle was to meet demand. An aspect of his conscience cautioned him against making light of such a thing. The money was too good, and soon his family was as well off as he always said. He also kept in close touch with Gilman, ever the perfect practice partner. They would train together often, taking care to stay in tip-top shape as much as possible throughout the years. Greentail always did his best to keep in touch with all his many friends, and he knew that, that he owed his fortunes to them. He made a special point of staying close to the group of friends he came to know so well during his time with the Nightwings, wherever they were. They shared a special understanding that put even Greentail at a loss for words sometimes. May. The Commonwealth had never provided a sense of home for the one they had called May the Moon Touch, so she was surprised on her return that she was so well treated. She felt uneasy about it, besides she knew that she would do her best to fulfill the pledge she had made to her friends. Even she could not have expected the impact she would have on the events that followed, which gave rise to the Saharian Union. Despite not fitting the image of any of the eight scribes, May nonetheless stood out alongside the others amid the teeming masses on the night of the scribe return scribes returns. She spoke of the scribe with such conviction and sincerity that the crowd was very moved. After the fall of the Commonwealth, there was a renewed interest in the legend of the eight scribes and many new interpretations of their histories and teachings. May found herself at the center of all this. Her way of speaking continued to compel a growing audience. She swayed many people from their astralist beliefs. Oh, it's all about the stars. Soon the eighth word, which had lost favor with the people during the reign of the Commonwealth, sought her out and asked her formally to join, and she did right away. Ah, uh, so it's more about the scribes than the stars, I see. Among her friends, she always remained close to Tizo, who more so than anyone could always make her laugh. She cited her relation with Jodariel as the single most important in her life. Jodariel would always provide for her circumspect perspective and the wisdom of experience. Whenever she felt genuine doubt, which was not very often, she sought out the reader of the Nightwings. If there was anyone whom she trusted as much as the scribes, it was him. May was always de always was devoted to her faith, but more so to her friends. Many people in the Saharian Union cited that her gentle manner and unwavering conviction helped them brave the challenging the changing times with courage and with grace. Okay. Next was the night, I believe. When the worm Gilman returned to the Commonwealth, he believed that he had regained something more important than his freedom, his honor. Gilman relinquished his night when he declined an opportunity to serve as captain on the Bloodborne. He was not interested in fighting any longer. Yet, as is sometimes the case with those such as he, a circumstance soon came about in which there came a need for him to once again make use of his military training. 
Thankfully, however, the scribes returned and ended peaceably. Gilman was on edge throughout the night, expecting violence to erupt at any moment, but the moment never came. When the matter was at last put to rest, then Gilman truly knew his night time as a night had ended. He declared to all those in earshot that he would never fight again. Unless, of course, there arose some ex other extraordinary set of circumstances again requiring him to fight, but he certainly hoped not. He still trained regularly, just in case, especially with his fleet-footed friend, Rookie Greentail. He was always grateful for the counsel of the reader, and would regale him over and over about the time they squashed the spawn of unfathomed plunderance. By that point, he had long forgotten about his days under the leadership of Sir Delucius, former commander. Breaking free of his abusive leadership was his first step towards gaining a bit of self-respect. Gilman never did return to his homeland of the Sea Dominion, and was content to lead a monastic life on a small residence in the hills. It was just high up enough to make him keep striving to conquer his fear of heights. <laughs> Other than that, an intense daily training regimen and the occasional visit from an old companion was more than enough to keep him optimistic and enraged. Engaged. He knew by then that honor was not something to be won, but a contract with oneself to be renewed each day. Tizo. The imp called Tizo was the first of his kind to achieve liberty through the rites. While he was not the only imp trained in the ways of the scribes, imps are native to the downside, thus care not for traveling abroad. This made, him, this made them useful to triumvirates. Yet Tizo had a different calling, and the Nightwings believed that he too could play a key part in his Wolfred Sandalwood's plan. During the night of Scribes' return, he stood out to the populace as something of a miracle. They had only heard of downside imps before, from legends of Howl the Swallow. Afterwards, he became something of an icon, representing both the fall of the Commonwealth and the beginning of a new era. He would visit his friend May at every opportunity. She was among the few who could consistently interpret what he meant, and they were always close as far as they met. Wolfred Sandalwood would sometimes send him little gifts, all the way from the downside. Despite the insurmountable distance between them, the friendship proved more than resilient. Gavin chirped about the reader of the Nightwings, with whom he built quite a rapport. The reader understood him perhaps better than anyone. And Tisa would often express wistful gratitude for all his time conducting the rites alongside the Nightwings, who made such sacrifices for him. Other than that, Tisa was diligent about his role as something of a living artifact, and helped interpret for the messenger imps that relayed news to and from the downside. Despite having gained significant celebrity, he never let it go to his head. Although he did take full advantage of his access to the Saharan Union's fishing industry. <laughs> That's funny. Now, what about the ones we didn't free? Volford. When the cycle of the rites ceased turning, Volford Sandal turned toward the starless sky and closed his eyes and prayed. It was all he could do at that stage of his plan. He aspired to assemble with liberated exiles representing each of the eight largest ethnic groups composing the population of the Commonwealth. They stand together as a vision of the eight scribes' return, inspiring the masses to embrace an older set of values from before the Commonwealth had tightened its grip. With the rites ending sooner than expected, this ideal scenario became impossible. Sandalwood's own freedom, for instance, was now forfeit, yet the plan did have contingencies. Fortunately, most of those contingencies did not prove necessary. Word reached him that, on the night of Scribe's return, his fellow liberated Nightwings stood together and their voices echoed through the streets. These former exiles who ought to have disappeared into the ranks of the Commonwealth's own leadership now stood united with its people, who poured from their homes in solidarity. It was imperative to Sandalwood that the stand against the Commonwealth be peaceful in its nature. An overwhelming show of popular support would be more than enough. Ensuring this was his priority, and in the end, the result was self-evident. The plan's goal had been achieved. Sandalwood kept busy after that as much as possible, providing counsel from afar to those who would be at the forefront of the birth of the Saharian Union. Of course, being strained in the downside meant that there was only so much he could do. Resting assured that the future of the nation was in capable hands, he turned his attention to the remaining exiles of the downside. They might never return to that new nation, but at least they could experience his triumphs and his struggles in some vicarious way. So he took to his old work, writing and printing. As literacy began to spread again throughout the Saharian Union, so too did exiles of the downside take to it. For his part, Sandalwood helped to teach as many as he could. More than that, he provided the material to read to send me an annual report about his latest events both in the Saharian Union and the downside. This periodical gave many exiles something to look forward to. He enjoyed exchanging letters with the reader of the Nightwings who kept him well abreast of how the, their other comrades in the fledgling nation fared. As Wolfram Sandalwood gained more fame throughout the land for all his sacrifices and his contributions, he said they remained steadfast about two things. The first was that the cause itself ought to remain in focus, the freedom that the people had achieved. It was a gift to be cherished, a set of values that needed to be nurtured. Nurtured. The second point he made was that he himself had little to do with the outcome. He would often praise the exiles of the Nightwings who had stood with him, each in turn by name. He never forgot any of them. One day, to commemorate his birthday, the people of the Saharan Union unveiled a monument depicting him and the Nightwings as imagined in their prime. While Sandalwood did not learn of it until much later, he said he was moved to tears then by the gesture. It has since ensured that those of us with memories more fallible than that of Sandwood likewise remember the achievements of his fellow former exiles in our cause. Aw, that's so nice. You know, when you put it that way, it makes it sound like it was actually good that he was left behind. Because he now leads the people, he leads the exiles. I mean, it's sad. He deserved freedom. Like, he fought for this. He deserved it more than anyone else. But at the same time, he's making life so much better for the exiles back in the, in the exile place. I mean, if not for him, it, it would stay that literal hellhole for eternity for everyone else. But thanks to him... They might actually have a decent life down there, so you know what? 
I, okay, I feel better about that decision then. All right, what about you? Several exiles of the night means cared more for the plan of Sandalwood than to return home from the downside. The crone called Bill Big Virtue was a prime example. Yeah, and that's why I wanted her to stick around, I figured. She had found a suitable environment to live within the dismal region known as Flagging Hands. There she had built up a thriving place of business known to many exiles in the land. With the rites having ended, she returned to her preoccupations, working away almost as though nothing had happened. When one gets to be more than 400 years of age, perhaps then even monumental events such as the culmination of the rites or the collapse of the Commonwealth are seen as trifling matters. Much of her effort was doubtless due to the influence of Sandalwood, someone whom she had admired now for decades. He had made clear that he could not requ requite her feelings for him, but what could have been a hurtful dismissal led only to a deeper understanding between them. She maintained an unlikely kinship with the heart, Pam the Thane, whom she had known during their time together on the Nightwings. They each had different strategies for dealing with life's day-to-day -day annoyances, a subject that they both found vital, if not fascinating, to no end. By and large, Bertrand kept focused on her work, whether casting small enchantments or imbuing talismans, the work brought her a sense of purpose, she would say. And the common with such services were strictly forbidden, and the downside there was a real need for simple luxuries, which the competing slug market could not always provide. Thus did Big Virtue continue to live up to her name, and the tales of her days with the Nightwings made her that much more the living legend. Cool. Pamitha, are you mad at me? After the rites ended, Pamitha Thane parted ways with the other Nightwings, stating that she needed time alone. The music changed. She reappears sometime after the fall of the Commonwealth, although she expressed mild surprise at the news. She claimed to have no knowledge of what went on, including what role the Hiring Remnants had in the events that reshaped the world on the other side. For her part, Pamitha feigned little interest, making the point that they were stuck, and what happened elsewhere had little to do with them now. Someone with whom she kept in contact was the bog dweller called Big Bertrude. They would discuss all sorts of matters long to the night and sometimes hunt together, too. One day while traveling to Back Bays, and Pamitha ran to her blood sister Tamitha for the first time since the conclusion of the rites. The reunion was not as amicable as Pamitha might have hoped, and Tamitha, still resentful of their history together, turned violent. Pamitha would later brush aside the incident, always had an injury to show for it. And from that point on, the Blood Sisters were back on speaking terms, at least for the most part. Oh god. She got attacked by her Blood Sister. Having long since felt as though she had no home to call her own, Pamitha continued traveling about the downside. As the tempest swept across the land, changing its features, she found it a sublime beauty, and in the starless night she could see just fine. Since such travels tend to remind her of when she was younger, could fly unfettered. Aw, oh, sounds like she had the worst of it. Poor thing. What about you? When the rise, with the rise drawn to a close, slug market's revenues fell precipitously, and Falcon Run was forced to liquidate his assets and close up shop. Yet, as is sometimes the case with those of an entrepreneurial lean, leaning, this time of hardship led to an epiphany, or at least a sudden change of fortune. One day, Falcon Run had a run-in with a messenger bearing news from the other side. Ron gave it, gave to it one of his remaining trinkets, which could not be sold. The following week, the messenger returned to bearing a tidy sum of wealth in, in newly minted coinage from the Safarian Union. Falconron cut a long-term deal with the messenger in then and there. Though his trade remained a gray area from a legal standpoint in the Saharan Union, the newfound fame of the downside caused Falconron's goods to explode in popularity. He later signed an elaborate agreement with Big Virtue and found a distribution partner on the other side through Rookie Greentail. His own business had expanded. Especially in the Saharan Union, Falconron's goods are still known for their superior quality, though he seems no li liability for any side effects. Cool. I feel like I should save these two for last. Let's let's go for the people who didn't make it. So you're pissed at me, aren't you? After the final liberation, right, Lendl refused to believe that the rites had truly ended. He would sit through night after consecutive nights, staring into the blackness of the sky, awaiting any kind of sign they might gain another chance of freedom. No such sign ever came. His fellow accusers started to express concern for him. Survival had become their top priority once liberty had slipped from their grasp. But Lendl dismissed them as weak fools. He insisted rather forcefully that any evening now, the stars would shine for him again and mark the way towards his inevitable freedom. He was, of course, mistaken. The others in his triumvirate were left with little choice but to abandon him. After that, the exile known as Lendl the Liar that was never seen again. However, there have since been sightings of a bedraggled demon who wanders the downside and bears Lendl's cruel countenance, suggesting he yet lives. Oh, God. What about you, doggo? I liked this guy, dude. He was nice. <laughs> I felt bad for him. The dog. As the cycle of the rights due to a close, it grew evident that a chance of freedom from the downside forever slipped from Dalbert and Almer Oldhart's grasp. Thus, they and the exiles of the fate returned to Jomira Valley. There they struggled to get by, as exiles of the downside tend to do. Sometime after the rites had ended, the old hearts at last heard the news that the Commonwealth had fallen. This was well after the fact, of course, but it brought, but it brought old Dalbert great joy. Despite his forthright manner, he had no love for the nation that cast him down, along with his son. Dalbert Oldhart passed peacefully in his sleep before the next new moon. Oh, he died. In his final days, he implored his son to undertake a pilgrimage to the scribes. Almer never shared his father's view of the scribes, but respected Dalbert's wishes, and so, after a period of mourning, Almer began a new journey. Not a day went by that Albert Oldhart did not think about his father and give thanks to him and speak to him at morning and at night. 
Would that the stars yet shone, for surely Dalberts would be there among them, smiling down at his son and watching over him and his king. Aww. What about this piece of crap? This coward. All his life, Sir Deluge had fled from one danger only to find himself facing another. He had escaped the war torn waters of the Sea Dominion, he had escaped the blood border of the Commonwealth, and now he had escaped the rites. After the rites had ended, many exiles wrapped up in the ancient test were crestfallen. As their last chances to return to their homes vanished, along with the stars above. But Deluge did not mind, for this outcome meant that, at last, there was no burden of responsibility weighing down on him. While most of his fellow exiles of the pirates yet longed for the waters of the Sea Dominion, driven as ever by their impulses towards conflict, Deluge settled down. With him, with him remained one of his companions, one Lady Seagrass, who had taken a liking to him for some reason. Reportedly, they disappeared into the waters of Worm Gulf, which may begin to explain the significant increase in worm population observed in the vicinity. <laughs> nice. What about you? Where is your god now? After the cycle, the rites had ceased, which would mill to return to the flagging hands region where she sealed herself within the pit of Milith. There, even her fellow exiles of the throne allegedly grew unnerved after a time and left her to her vile work. Sometime later, the pit of Milith erupted into flame, so intense was the conflagration that it could be seen all the way from Jomir Valley. Her arson was suspected, though the cause was never verified, and many bog dwellers in the region were forced to flee. A tempest blowing from the north finally quenched the flames. When at last the ashes settled and the grounds had cooled, the side of the fire was scarred beyond recognition, and no trace of which Udmilde could be found. As for the contents of for the pit of Milith, which notably included a profane object thought to be the remains of Islak, all of it was gone as well. Back in the Saurian Union, Udmild's repeated threats of the return of Yisrael were thoroughly investigated. No credence was found to any of her claims. Yeah, so she burned herself trying to resurrect her god. Nice job. Oh, mating season for the worms. Yeah, exactly. Doggo! <laughs> Barker Ashpaws never had much interest in returning to the Commonwealth, where he always found his bylaws to be stifling. So when the rites ended, he did not care at first. He soon grew very bored. The rites had given his life a certain sense of structure he had always needed. He missed the raw anticipation of it all. He decided to continue conducting the rites for the thrill of it. He bent some of the rules and replaced some of the objects, but it was close enough. His pack mates of distance proved more than happy to participate, unless they ran against each other back in Jomir Valley. Gradually, other exiles familiar with the rites, as well as those who had not heard of it at all, started to take an interest. They ended up giving Barker Ashpaw some healthy competition. His old feud with Rookie Greentail ceased meaning anything to him, and he forgot all about it amid his new pursuits. Ultimately, even Barker Ashpaws, who had led such a discretionless existence to that point, found something of a calling through the rites. Whether he took the rights less seriously than any other exile of his time or more was often debated by those who watched him work. So he was doing it just for fun, that's funny. Okay, what about you? You probably still hate my guts, and you hate your sister's guts. I mean, you attacked her. Throughout her exile, Tamworth the Thane was motivated by a single goal, to return to the Commonwealth and exact vengeance on her ancient enemies. When she realized the rights had ended and that she would never see her mountain home again, she nonetheless remained determined to aid her people however possible. She had gathered certain information pertaining to the intentions of the Nightwings, who had formed a pact to regroup on the other side after their liberation. Other such reports exposed certain weaknesses in the Commonwealth's defenses and revealed to the Hiving Rims the opportunity for a risky but potentially impactful strike. As Tamtha could not participate in the assault, she learned what happened well after the outcome. On that night, no one described return, the Commonwealth had fallen. The Hiving Remnants thus prevailed at last without even having to fight. Soon after the fall of the Commonwealth, Tamtha encountered a blood sister Pamtha come to pay her a visit. Tamtha had hoped their people's victory on the side would be cause for reconciliation. Tamtha was skeptical of her intentions, however, and lashed out at it. So wait, did the Harps take over? I thought we won. We peacefully took over the Commonwealth. The Harps didn't win. Tamtha was skeptical of her intentions, however, and lashed out at her. Tamtha made no attempt to elude the attack and was struck full on. Cost, this cost Pamtha the use of her right wing, yet after she recovered, she shrugged the incident aside and said maybe they would call it even now. From that point on, the Blessed just kept a formal distance but were cordial with each other. Knowing that the conflict on the other side had ended, Tamitha retreated to the crags of Black Basin and grew ever more distant. Aww. But was closest to her surmise that her inability to reconcile with her blood sister was at the heart of this, though for her part, Tamitha never once admitted to any such weakness. What about you? What is your, where is your silver tongue going to get you now, asshole? When Manly Tindersoft realized the rites had ended and that he no longer could return to the Commonwealth through this ancient means, he was outraged. He cursed the scribe, spewing forth such a slew of blasphemy as to be very unbecoming of one of his high status and daring. When at last he calmed himself, he focused all his energies on attempting to find another means of homecoming. He maintained regular contact with his relative family on the other side via messenger imp, and used their vast resources to explore other means of escape. He tried using an elaborate pulley system, he attempted to retrofit a flying bandwagon with superior propulsion, he tried an imp raft, a hot air balloon, and even prayer. Nothing worked. There was only one way to escape the downside, and now it was gone. Tendersoft bankrupted his family in these vain attempts. At last, such was his shame that he retreated to the teeming woods of Black Basin to Cinderroot. There he yet wallows, complaining to his comrades of the chastity who still put up with him, either about his own misfortune or the latest news from the other side. 
Sorry, dude. This guy seemed kind of cool. I kind of felt bad for him. Once it became clear to Ignatius that the rites were drawing to close, he knew that it was time for him and the Templars to call it quits. The first thing the Templars decided to celebrate, and that they did, for many, many nights. The revelry did eventually subside. The exiles parted amicably and went their separate ways. He roamed the downside then, searching for some meaning in his life, something, sometimes taking odd jobs requiring his brute strength. He never remained alone for very long and took on many lovers in his time. However, he sometimes thought about the one he had called Curly Horns and what became of her. Though his glory days as the most powerful conductor of the rites had long since passed, he always enjoyed the fearsome reputation he had cultivated at that time. Sorry, Orlick. After the shimmer pulled closer for what would be the last time, Orlick looked around him in the flickering light of the nightly still burning pyre. He then turned to the fall of Solium and looked up towards the black starless sky. He cursed the eight scribes, then one after the other. After that, he strode forward towards the waters coursing from the side of Mount Lodio, and without hesitating, he cast himself down. Orlick's body was never recovered. He killed himself. The drop from Mount Lodiel does not appear survivable, though Orlek did survive it once. That time, however, he was filled with fury, such as the betrayal he had suffered when his fellow exile claimed his rightful freedom. This time, Orlek was filled with nothingness, and chose to leave the downside in the one way he still knew he could. The other Nightwings who were witness to this never forgot what they saw. Damn. It's just you two now. Who should I talk to first? I want to talk to my friend last, so let's talk to her first. Oh, it's both of them. After the cycle of the rites ceased turning, the lone minstrel bade the remaining Nightwings take the Black Wagon and seek their fortunes elsewhere in the downside. Their parting was heartfelt, but brief. He remained there at the summit of Mount Lodiel with Celeste, where the two of them would chronicle the final outcome of the cycle. Neither Tariq nor Celeste were ever seen again. We know all this now through song attributed to them. Some claim these songs originated in taverns of the Saharian Union and merely were imbued with the weight of folklore. However, exiles liberated from the downside corroborated each other's claims that having met this duo that presided over the liberation rites. Another folktale suggests these minstrels were heralds of the scribes. Having fulfilled their obligations, they departed the world we know and rejoined their patrons. One of their famous songs describes another simpler outcome, that the two gave up their duties to the rites in favor of a life that they could share together. In any case, they are likely to remain the subject of such verses and such songs, for it was they who watched over the rites and ushered in her times. Minstrel, okay. There's one more account which warrants mention. The Nightwings conducted the rites under the guidance of a reader. Little is known of him. However, some accounts of him begin to paint a picture. We know he was of common birth. Always directionless and prone to misremembering at times. The journey to the downside left him close to death. It was then that the Nightwings found him. They brought him from the brink. He showed them the path. He pressed onward with the others. He had made a vow to help his friends be free. Thus did the cycle of the rice commence its final turns. When the final ride arrived, the reader's freedom was at stake. That freedom he, indeed, achieved ere the morning's light. From that point on, accounts of him diverge. It said the voice which troubled him he never heard again. Some say he helped to form our Saharian Union. Though whether that is true, only he knows. Someday, perhaps, that reader's own star shall emerge. Then shall pierce the dark of night in all its brilliant glory. Until such time and ever after, all of us gives thanks. See, that's what I'm hoping for. I hope that I'll be like the new star and then I can help free the remaining exiles. But even if I can, at least it doesn't sound like life is so bad for them down there now.